Welcome to the Open Era Podcast. My name is Devane Desai and I'm joined as always by Mr. Simon Bushel Bush recording on a Sunday. How's it going, sir? It's going really well. I miss our Sunday recording day sometimes. Just not doing them every week, perhaps. But <laughs> periodically, they're quite nice. It's true. It's, it's a very nice um, end of week um, recap, get together, talk about stuff, talk about some tennis. It is nice. And also, quite a bit of stuff has happened, which does feel like a horrible cliche when it comes to tennis. But Bush, a lot of stuff did happen. So I will refrain from the formalities and get into it. Let's start with what we witnessed just this last week. Hugo Humbert winning in Dubai, but I think the big story coming out of that tournament, Simon, was the Andre Rublev default. Apparently, another line judge overheard him call a lines person um, a swear word in Russian. Uh, not the worst swear word from the translations that I saw either, but in any case... Someone else overheard this. The picture is pretty illuminating, Bush. Like, there's a lot of good Getty shots of Rublev right in this guy's face. So no matter what he said, shouldn't be doing that. But interesting, like the the aftermath of, of this incident, Bush is about quite a few things. So I, I wanted to ask you where he wanted to start on this, because I think there's there's quite a few different ways we can talk about this. There are a few ways that you can go into it. And I thought it was interesting to see some of the direction that this got taken during the course of the week. I think it's undoubtedly probably the biggest story of the week, at least the most critical inflection point of what, of how tennis presented itself to the world. The Saudi yeah. stuff we can come on to in a second. But in general, when your world number five gets defaulted from a large tournament for screaming in the face of a lion judge. One of those stories that breaks through that you see on regular news headline uh, scroll pages, like on the right hand of the, the page, it's like, oh, Andre Rublev is beside... Um, political news? Yeah, that's never a good sign. I think they call it cut through in the political world, don't they? <laughs> yeah. The idea that you, you can actually talk to people as opposed to operating within your bubble. So we're breaking outside of the open era bubble for all of uh, five minutes here to talk about <laughs> the idea that screaming uh, at someone doing their job might be considered not good. I don't know. Uh, are you aware whether this is a, a scorching hot one that I'm about to unleash, yeah. Dev? But if you were in the office... And you did this to a fellow co-worker. How do you think that would go down? Not well. Not well. <laughs> In most places, probably. Probably not UFC or like something else. But yeah, I don't think in this, in most cases, that's not cool at all. And I think that's probably the most critical element to this, which is that he has been, him being Andre Rublev, has been on a, on a trajectory of more and more extreme behavior, boorish mm -hmm. behavior. Uh, I don't know if boorish is the right word. Just very worrying and troubling behavior. Unhinged. I think you could say unhinged, to be fair. Mm -hmm. Like hitting himself and going on verbal tirades. I, I think you could say it's it's unhinged. Yeah. I guess the context for this, for anyone who did miss it during the course of the week, is uh, during a semifinal match against Alexander Bublik, Lions judge called a ball long during a rally that, that Rublev lost. He, he went... Uh, insane. <laughs> he started screaming at a Lions judge um, and was defaulted from the match for it. Uh, I think we can probably park the Alexander Bublik -like asking for the match to be restarted kind of <laughs> angle to this because, you know, that's neither here nor there on that one. I think it's a red herring in all of this. But in general, I, there's, there's, I thought about this in a few ways. A, the default was fine. And I obviously have no issue with that. And I think in this particular occasion, it's one that was, whether or not you want to describe it as being warranted or not, like that behavior, regardless of what was being said, was worthy of a default. The second part being Rublev's kind of descent into um, on-court behavior, which has been awful, starting with him screaming at an umpire in Shanghai, then screaming at an umpire at a UTS event. Is it Dallas? I think it was in America, not too long ago, the start of this year, and then screaming at a Lions judge here and finally getting defaulted for it. So it's not like there hasn't been a, a track record of this behavior before. And then I guess sort of tangentially related to that of how many players have acted like this previously and have not been defaulted, which is, I guess, part of the, uh, the wider conversation. And then the mechanisms behind whether or not this should have been reviewed and how much you take the word of a Lions judge over a, a player and what they say. Um, on 
both accounts, my opinion is pretty clear. Start defaulting more players, A, for doing that sort of thing, and then B, uh, players don't get a fucking choice in this. <laughs> if a line yeah. judge told you that he swore yeah. at you, then you have to take the word on it. I think that's fair. And like the fr- the first thing I thought of is like Andre Rublev's having a tough time, and like this is kind of what he does, and it's it's troubling. Like obviously, it's a tough look and not a great look for your sport in general to see this. But I did find it interesting. Like I thought the biggest topic was about the players and how there's no real like due, uh, due process for them in this case. And like the fact that Rublev is defaulted off of basically like a secondhand report and no one is like looking at the tape. There is no VAR as, as David, Davidovich Fakina and Kasakina have mentioned and which they've called for, which at first I thought was insane because I think VAR is ruining soccer, but I get what they're kind of getting at here in, in a couple of ways. I mean, because then we also saw the PTPA speak up and say that they would uh, lodge a defense for Rublev as well when he appeals this, which he's going to, because I do think it's a bit, a bit much that there is no sort of, Hey, you're the supervisor of the event. Maybe you should check that. (laughs) Maybe you should go and like double check yourself. Like, I think that aspect was a bit, um, relevatory to me because initially I I also thought Rublev has lost his mind a little too many times in a public way that it's disconcerting to say the least. And like, I, as much as I love the guy, I think we both do. We both talk about how much we love watching. We both talk about how much we want to see him win in some ways so we can avoid some of these these self-harm-esque meltdowns. So at first I was troubled and I still kind of am, but I also do question how they go about litigating this kind of stuff because I'm not, I'm not denying what you're saying is wrong in any way in the sense that players should own up to their shit when they're acting like children or acting like jerks or acting like assholes, but... In some ways, I do I do find it interesting that it's just kind of like, well, yeah, okay, you're defaulted, and then we carry on, you know? No, very fair. I think there clearly has to be some mechanism in place for um, players to, and, and for the system in general, to have a level of accountability to it. I think that is, I have no issue with that at all. I think what I, what I do have issue in, in the fact is that that is kind of covering over some of the cracks here of what the behavior was itself. Yeah. implying that if there had been review <laughs> exactly. here, Being then this Being two inches happen. from someone's face is not cool once you freeze frame it on VAR review either, is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, and also the idea that like the content of what he was saying might be indication of whether or not he could be found innocent in this. Like, It's not like he was reading him a fucking cooking recipe, was it? Like, no. It's, <laughs> no. <laughs> like if that had been the case, would he have not been disqualified? Like this, That's absurd to me, that concept. <laughs> I'm really unpleased with what you've just done. Can you please review it, please? No, I think I think you're right. Yeah. The the other interesting part I thought about this, Simon, is the the line calling and the uh, the idea of getting electronic line calling everywhere, which also seemed to be another thing that people seem to rally behind. And the fact that we do have now on the tours like this. This thing that some tournaments have it, some tournaments don't. Wimbledon doesn't. The French Open doesn't. Um, and I, for the longest time, and I still kind of do believe this, like once you remove these people, I think you're removing something that, of the ecosystem of tennis that is part of its like greatness. And like removing like this idea of having volunteers and people who love the game come in and and help call the tournaments. I think that is maybe the romantic aspect of this. but also. We probably don't need them anymore. And if we're going to have them in some places, let's have them everywhere. It's just like how we have in sub cup competitions in soccer, no VAR in some stadiums because they don't have it. In another stadium, we do have it. So they'll allow it. It doesn't make sense to me. I think the VAR element of this is is important. I think it's an important comparison because... Part of FIFA's argument against this was the was protecting the the, uh, the sanctity of local level grassroots football, right? That they want to have an e- even an equal playing field. Less referee abuse. Less referee. Less abuse. referee abuse. Yeah. yeah, I'm laughing as I'm saying this out loud. I'm defending something that FIFA is saying. Um, not a big fan, in case you can't tell. But I think one thing one thing it has become abundantly clear on this one, which is that. Electronic line calling has prevented shitty behavior directed towards people doing their jobs. That is one thing that is very, Mm -hmm. very true. Mm -hmm. It has not 
it has not stopped uh, abuse towards umpires specifically, but it has taken away people that are the targets of abuse. That is horrifying if you think about it on the surface. Like the, we have the to idea protect that, these people. The, the idea mm-hmm. is that we have to protect these people from these maniacs who are playing tennis on the tours. Because you know what? I've seen I've seen a few John Isner tweets, and I honestly think that, yeah, we should protect them from these people. I find it really bad, to be honest. I also think that it's a it's a good innovation for the sport. And I think from a for an overall product perspective, quote unquote, it's a it's a very good step forward. And I am one of these people that is very supportive of it coming in all around every tournament, every surface, because I think it stops this. I just don't enjoy watching a uh, underpaid lines judge <laughs> yeah, being exactly. yelled at. Yeah. No, no. I don't find that behavior particularly inviting. It. Like, I think we, we're over the, this is the zaniest um, tennis player meltdown clip show. I, at least I hope so. But it's, it's like a cynical part of me. It's like, that's the only reason we have them still. Or like, that's why we have them to to gin up some drama when we when we need it um, in the entertainment aspect. But no, I think you're totally right. And it's, it's beyond time. Like, yeah, it, it's... I'm glad kind of the, the conversation has taken this turn. I do think people are skirting by Rublev melting down the way he did. And and like you said, Simon, no matter what he said, not not holding himself to the standard I think the, the player should be held to. Like we, a lot of this happens. A lot of really dumb shit happens across the tournaments we watch uh, week to week, year to year. And I think it's... Yeah, it's it requires some sort of I think retros like introspection about like what we what we're breeding here, like what we what we're trying to grow in terms of like um, villains and the best storylines and like oh you love to hate them like it it I don't know it's it feels gross sometimes and it does feel grosser because we do seem to elevate the people who are the best at it. So if Andre Rublev was American and he was yelling and and again we we like him for the most part but I, I think he'd be celebrated a bit for this i don't know maybe probably it depends what kind of media landscape that you're operating in and i think it depends on how it's presented as well i think i might be naive in my belief on this one but i think we might be past that a little bit at this point i hope i don't maybe know not. man i this tennis making bar stool happens like when right that's the <laughs> that's the sick part that's the sick part. Uh, it's coming for all of us. It's coming for you, tennis. Yeah. Anything else here? We want to go to the the Saudi stuff. Oh yeah. I mean, what a transition, Dev. <laughs> throwing me a a nice easy softball to transition. I'm passing to you nicely. the rock to see what you do with it. I will say, like, as a closing point on the Rublev stuff, and more, more, more generally, um, workplace abuse is not uh, is not cool. <laughs> It shouldn't happen, regardless of where it. Check out this reel place. of workplace abuse. It's got fifty million views. Dog. Just, I think, a little <laughs> bit of humility and a bit of empathy is what I would encourage people to think about. Think about the person that is on the receiving end of that. The next time that we want to celebrate and think about this as part of a clip show is that there is a person on the other end of it, regardless of whether or not you believe their incredibly difficult job is to try and call a millimeter in or out of a tennis ball. I mentioned that clip show specifically because I saw one the other day and it, it had the Serena US Open uh, lines person thing. And rewatching that today is awful. Absolutely awful. It is a horrendous <laughs> moment. Like awful, awful, awful. I'm trying to think what was what was good about that in any way, right? So, yeah, I think what the conclusion of this segment is, if you're going to abuse people, make sure that you are inside of venture capitalist firms or the tech (laughs) industry. (laughs) Or banking, I guess, is also another one. (laughs) Those are all fine. Politics, Politics, yeah, definitely. (laughs) So there's a a limited quantity of (laughs) professions that you can do this in. (laughs) Healthcare, I assume, yeah. Okay, moving on. The Saudi... (laughs) PIF Fund has launched a multi-year strategic partnership with the ATP that includes a whole whack of things, including on-court branding at some of the big air ATP tournaments, including Indian Wells. 
the PIF are also the sponsor of the rankings. Uh, whatever Pepperstone was, RIP. <laughs> shouts to <laughs> shouts to PIF. They are the new rankings people. Yeah, but it's not a surprise, but official now. I guess the question, the question on everyone's mind: What's going on here? <laughs> uh, money is talking. <laughs> yeah. Dev. That is that is what is happening here. The uh, the opportunity to open the wallet has happened, and the brown envelope has been firmly inserted into the back pocket of the ATP, and there's been uh, very little to no pushback. I saw a uh, an article written by Gary Nathan of um, Defector, which I thought was well written. Um, the sort of crux of this being that, uh, I will quote, um, in contrast to the lengthy and doomed power struggle that played out in pro golf, the tennis tours seem eager to roll over and take their money. So this is part of a, a wider discussion, I think, that's involved and has evolved on our on our Discord over the past few months, which is what is what is the opposition to this happening? And um, there's obviously like a few elements to this that you could dive into, but I've sort of taken a different um, position on this that I find kind of fascinating, which is what is the what is the thing that binds these tours together in the sense of what is the legitimacy behind the ATP? So where, if there was ever going to be pushback to this happening and obviously like human rights abuse, um, certainly questions of, of, of corruption, um, questions of uh, levels of um, devastating impacts on people who have different sexuality preferences to being in Saudi Arabia, many, many elements to this. But why would this not... Uh, why would this fall apart? Like, where where would the pressure come from in order for this to not happen inside of the ATP? So, what's well, something that we don't talk about enough, Dev? Sorry mm-hmm. to go on long about this, but it is important. One of the things we don't talk about often enough is that the WTA was born out of protest. It is a protest organization, and at its core, it believes in equal opportunities for women, and that extends to equal pay. So... You can understand how this plays out in the WTA, for example. And we've seen this like out in the open between Billie Jean King, Martin Avrez, Lova, and Chris Everett in terms of the acceptance of money. And really, like that is that is a play out of particular brands of feminism as well, if you want to take it to that length as well, which is about um and this is kind of like a, an extended version of the meme of um, the girl boss and like more female drone pilots in terms of equality and all that kind of stuff. The idea that um, women need to take money to, you know, elevate the status and all this mm-hmm. kind of stuff on one hand. And on the other hand, it's like, no, we need to think about where the money is coming from. And um, that is that at its core is an issue of feminism. So that's playing out in the WTA side of things. And I think that is that is a fine and open discussion. I have no issue with that. I think that's the, there are smarter people than me that are having those discussions. The ATP side, Dev, what the fuck is this organization? <laughs> like, this organization stands for nothing. Like, I tried to do growth. the digging into the... Quote, yeah, unquote, like growth, yeah. And if you even take a look at their One Vision document and their key trends and go through it, this is fucking bollocks. There's just nothing in here at all in terms of a, of a vision of what this tour is supposed to be, like what it stands for. Um, what are those elements that has a level of like what it's, what its presentation to the world is, how it wants to be viewed. It's nothing. It's just trash. Um, and I say this as someone who loves the sport, but I think by and large, the ATP is a completely like illegitimate organization because what are the things that what are the things that we hold as true about it (laughs) do you do you have anything i'm not sure i do like when i think about the atp i think about something that governs the rules and seems intent on selling rights to or selling tournaments to the most horrendous organizations that it seems or 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 states in some capacity it seems it can get away with and there seems very little pushback from inside of the sport yeah, I, I, I'm I with you. And I, I mean, to, to pile on even further, I, I think the ATP can, sh- should consider themselves lucky that they're even on the, the PIF list of, of things to invest in or like things to get behind. And, and I bet you they're probably jockeying quite hard to not be forgotten 
as as they continue to invest in all sorts of sporting events around the world, as well as in Saudi Arabia itself. So I I mean the politicking on behind the scenes, you can only imagine the lobbying and, and shit that went down Bush. Um no, I it's we've been, we've the, the stage has been set and it, it's going to increase. I think I think the ATP not really standing for anything is is kind of a really good place to almost leave it because from Zverev on down, um, they really haven't shown they do. And again, not to say that uh, they don't go to other places that are questionable, but in terms of like ethos or like what it means to be the ATP, it doesn't feel like you can say anything. And I think that is vividly different than the WTA. And that is probably a reason why they stand in stark contrast in our minds, at least. I think so, yeah. Maybe let's let's take a break. There's a bit more that I wanted to do on this topic, but yeah. we've gone long already. And but there's there is some stuff that I want to touch on. Yeah, let's do it. Let's hit a break, and when we come back, we'll finish up this discussion and hit parting shots on Open Era. Welcome back to the Open Air Podcast. Dev, we left on a very cheery and bright note in the mm-hmm. last segment. And to continue that on, I want to touch on uh, a topic about the ATP um, and really at, like power structures in general within tennis and how something like Saudi Arabia and the Saudi Arabia deal happens. Um, it came up during our Discord conversation during the co- during the course of the week about the Ed uh, Zitron article, The Rot Economy, which I know has been doing the rounds. I'll quote the start of his, his piece. His podcast is good too, Bush, just to say, I'm sure some people have listened to it who listen to our show, but his podcast is also solid. It is. He does have a bit of Barry shit peas about him, if you know who that is. <laughs> from the the accent. accent as well is impeccable. It's an, I can't it's a lot, quite I love place it. it. <laughs> So, quote Ed Zitron, at the center of everything I've written for the last few months, if not the last few years, it's a cancerous problem with the fabric of how capital is de- deployed in modern business. Public and private investors, along with the market themselves, have become entirely decoupled from the concept of what, quote, good business truly is, focusing on one metric, one truly uh, noxious metric above over all else, uh, growth, close quote. So, I think we can agree on that. I think the idea of what is considered to be uh, sustainable in tennis is a really fascinating discussion, not just from an environmental standpoint, but from the perspective of how do you keep this tour going? Where are you going in the world? Where are you taking money from? What sponsorships are you taking? Um, What is considered too much money? What is considered not enough money? Like what is the distribution of that money to players? Like the list goes on and on and on. Like so why are we driving for growth? Why are we going to these new areas? What are we doing all these areas, like these different elements for. And I don't think it's just in the public sector. I think as as Zitron outlines there, I think this does touch into tennis as well, which is if this sport is continually growing and taking money from places that um, I'd say have less than stellar reputations, then I think you have to present to the world a binding vision of some description of why you are doing this. Like you have to give some level of accountability of why this is happening. Um, to have any level of legitimacy, which is why I was hitting it so hard in the previous segment, which is that I don't think the ATP has any. I don't know whether you agree with that or not. No, I I mean, I agree. I think, I think this is like a desperate move. I say, like I alluded to earlier, like I I don't feel like they're operating from a position of strength. I think they, they do understand that their guys, Novak, Rafa, et cetera, are already cutting deals with Saudi Arabia and doing things on their own. So if they don't get in on this, what does that mean for them? And that goes to what you're saying. Like They're following in this regard and they're following in a way that says to me, they're willing to do whatever. They'll put, they'll put <laughs> PIF wherever they need to put it on whoever they need to put it. They might get it tattooed on JMAC at some point before a tournament. Um, yeah, they're they're behind as well, you know. Like I, again, to be extremely cynical about this, but there's something to be said about jumping in two feet first into the whole idea of of not giving a damn about quote unquote morals or ethics. Like we we joke about the Formula One and like what they stand for, what they don't stand for. But is there really so much difference between the two? I I fail to see that much really. I fail to see how wealth isn't inextric- inextricably linked with 
the success and vitality of, of both sports. It's true. And I think at the heart of this is a conversation about um, power and change specifically. So one thing that always comes up, even here in F1 as well, to touch on your point is like we go to these places because us being there, hey, you know, it's it's it helps grow the sport in the area and like it, our values, which we don't fucking have, which we just previously established, get spread in those places and you see a, a better world and, you know. It's the Simpsons meme of Lionel Hutz when he goes into the mental bubble. Um, so I have this, my own personal kind of model of four areas. Um, I don't know what we call them. Power structures, uh, like Pillars. how you get involved. Pillars. Pillars, let's say. Um, and I kind of map a lot of things back in my life to like these four areas and think about how power gets represented or like what areas are you pushing on and through all of these different ones i came to the position that i couldn't see any change for in tennis like i can't see any mechanism where it's gonna this is gonna stop so i just wanted to run through them quickly like the first is what i by the way this is my own words like is this is bollocks really but in general it's just my own model so it helps me understand the world the first is hearts and minds which is obviously a ridiculous term, but more accurately, it's it's your sort of uh, storytelling and and PR side of the world. Um, it's how people make sense of things, and that has power in in certain capacities. I think the most important one is this is why uh, billionaires buy newspapers, right, to help control storytelling mm -hmm. and help to control like um, how they're viewed and how the world is understood by people. I think it's an important area. I don't think it has as much power as we think it does sometimes, but also like it's still a valuable one. So from that mechanism, I think there's been a pretty out, a pretty good outpouring of uh, people that are against this deal within tennis. Do I think that the mechanism of guilt or shame is enough to prevent the ATP from doing this kind of thing? No, I do not. And do I think that they will lose sponsorship over this? Absolutely not. I don't think that either. So from that mechanism, I don't think that the storytelling media side of things, people's ability to share information on social media, that kind of bracket and bucket will do anything to change this deal. Uh, unless you disagree with me. Like, I think it's a long-term play, right? The idea that you want to change people's perspective. And I, like... This, this area is, is littered with interesting conversations about like um, how to change hearts and minds and how that changes power in general. This is why fucking journalists have such a high opinion of themselves is that they used to be the only <laughs> game in town. So you just did one transparency article that got round in the New York Times and then a senator resigned and you felt like the biggest deal in the world, but that doesn't fucking happen anymore. So like that area does still have some power in it, but I don't think it holds as much as it used to do. Yeah, no, I think you're right. And I also <laughs> think like the idea that it, it, it's easier for people to justify once their favorites are doing it. And it, like hell, like literally everyone is doing it. So at this point, like the, there is no one holier than thou. You have to you have to sign up for this in some way, in some ways, depending on how much you want to is up to you. But that's pretty much it. Um <laughs> I, totally. Trivia for you. Do, you. do you know what Pepperstone did, Simon? I looked it up, but I figured it out. No idea. They're an Australian online broker that provides CFD trading. So listen, the AT once again, desperation. <laughs> and here we are. Here we are. Out of the frying pan into the fire, <laughs> as we say. So that first bucket of hearts and minds, like that's rife with sports washing. Your second area is a sort of like within the construction of like within the system itself. So you're sort of technocrat side of things. Um, so your players council, do I think the players council has any pushback to this inside of the ATP or with inside of tennis? I, I clearly not because they would have done something already and this wouldn't have happened. So like, that's your biggest measurement of whether that would have occurred. Third being direct action being both constructive and destructive. If you want to use that language. Do I think the PTPA, would stop this something that exists outside of the constructs of tennis no <laughs> do i i guess more accurately do i think there is a labor stoppage over the atp signing a deal with saudi arabia i don't i just don't 
I haven't seen anything to suggest that. In the WTA, yes, I could see that being a, I could see that being an issue. In the ATP, I cannot. Do you think that is reasonable or am I too critical of that? Zero percent. No, you're right. And then finally, point four, the political world. Do we see anything inside of politics stopping this happening? Certainly, I mean, no, right? Who's legislating the ATP? Is the US government against this? I don't think so. Are any local markets against this? I don't think so. So on all those four mechanisms, you sort of press hearts and minds, technocrats inside of the sport, direct action outside of the sport, so outside of power structures, the PTPA, and then the political world. I don't see any mechanism for this stopping happening. Like, I don't see a the growth idea um, stopping. Like, where are we going to go next? Are we going to fucking roll out a tournament in central Moscow? Is that where it's going to happen? Is that is that where we uh, are going to deem uh, reasonable at this point? Eventually, yeah. Yeah, they'll go back for sure. Um, <laughs> I mean, whether, it, yeah, when, when they feel it's okay, probably after a few other people have gone first, knowing knowing them, so... It's bad, man. I, don't, you know, I, I have no zero faith in any of the four four factors you mentioned there. I mean, the the sort of backlash or like the public back, I, uh, the fans maybe being against this. I I think that the, the the train has passed long long ago, and, and now it's now it's a whole it's a whole different set of discussions on maybe mitigation, which I don't even think maybe that is that valuable either at this point. Like, I think we might be looking at this from a way that is not, not helpful sometimes, you know? So I think this is like adjusting to this new normal or like, how do we adjust to it is is basically the next kind of focus. Yeah. I mean, I guess the ATP's line on this would be they get legitimacy from their fans, right? They get legitimacy from, people um yeah effectively they're fans like th- they only operate as long as people continue to go and watch the sport um i'm not convinced that's even true anymore myself like i'm not i think the whole idea of growth has eaten so much to the point that you can run you can run a tournament in in Riddha in saudi arabia and seven people show up or you can do a WTA finals where nine people show up, but the line still went up. So it was a success. I don't think, I think fans are entirely decoupled from yeah. this. Well, they say there's like a number, like 150% growth. So it went from like nine, nine to a hundred people. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of that. Thank you to listening to my, uh, my rant. <laughs> I appreciate it. And thank you to the listeners for engaging in that as well. I appreciate it. Open era gold standalone episode on this coming soon as we keep it up but eventually we will do it um no it was great bush and i i mean top of mind you're going to see it at indian wells all over the court i remember at what and an mls i think herbalife was a sponsor of the la galaxy for a long time and like herbalife was kind of like known as a, a fraudster company and like the pyramid scheme-esque um so whatever i saw that on their their kit i'm like what kind of two-bit operation like this is the best team in the league what's going on here and i do wonder if seeing that pif logo will do anything for someone watching this knowing knowing what's going on i wonder if that that'll click in with anyone or maybe not but we shall see um we're gonna take another break when we come back it's parting shots we'll actually talk some tennis probably and two challenges remaining coming up next Welcome back to the Open Era Podcast. Parting shots, Bush. Let's talk tennis. Rapid fire, Ugo and Bear joining an elite crew. When I saw this stat, I thought I had lost my mind, which is, is definitely possible. But Ugo and Bear is 6-0 and in ATP Tour Finals. He's only the third man to do this. If you can name the other two people who have, I'll give you a substantial amount of money, real money. Is that buyers on that list? No, you'll never get it because it's insane as well. Ernest Gulvis is one of them. Okay, never would have got that. <laughs> and to save this podcast, I'll tell you the second because Martin Kleesen is the second, right? How? How? Incredible. Incredible. I think 
and QB and, and Akaraz won their first five, so they jo- they don't join this crew. But shout out to Ugo, shout out to his his coach slash partner. I think their team is working really well. Um, but also shout out to attacking tennis Bush because I think that might be helping Ugo in these these finals because he's going for the Lions rather than um, letting people dictate to him. Uh, curly hair boys unite. I think we can <laughs> phrase that one. Um, great win for him. I like watching him play. He is, I think, inside of the top 20 now. I think he's back inside of the top 20 following this, which is obviously very cool. A great week for him as well. He beat three seeds along the way. Beating Danny Medvedev is no easy feat, especially on a hard court as well, and a place that Medvedev has had success. So I am excited to see what he does for the rest of the season. He should be a better player on clay than he is, though, Dev. He really should, yeah. just given the game style that he has and given everything that he should be able to do on that surface. He does not have a good record at Wimbledon at all. So maybe one day we'll see him make more of a breakthrough. He He's a he's a better player than I think his performances at Grand Slam level have shown so far, and he has more to give. Excellent return game two, which I feel like should, should help him. Um, on clay, if he can keep this going, but definitely going to be a, a dangerous person um, in the States for the Sunshine Devil. He's also, Bush, he's at a career win rate of 50% versus the top 10, which is, mm-hmm. to put that in perspective, like the people who are also on that list are like goats <laughs> in like all-time greats. <laughs> in fact, the only other active players on that list are Carlos Alcaraz, who are who is in early days, obviously, Andy Murray and Daniil Medvedev. So pretty damn cool for Ugo. Also, on the flip side of this, Bush, our guy, your guy, Casper Ruud is now 0-6 in non-250 finals. That's tough. The Demon beats him in Acapulco. The Demon with an excellent couple weeks, but they kind of ruined this court at this tournament, Simon. I... I don't know what to say. They're doing this at multiple tournaments now. They're ruining the courts. Our beautiful marine blue <laughs> court in Acapulco is no more. It's been turned the color. What's the, what's the, the made me think of it. The thick of it, the thick of it quote. <laughs> oh, yeah. That this man has turned the fucking country into the color of the BBC weather map. <laughs> That's kind of how I feel about the Acapulco court. They have made it look so awful. Terrible. Used to be great. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, I don't know, Demon, Bush, do you, do you, uh, do you change your outlook on Alex Demonauer at all? I think good kid tries hard, reliably consistent, but sometimes weaponless against the big guys is, is where we've been netting out. But he's, he's fully morphing into the Leighton Hewitt arc of his career now. Sure it is, yeah. And I'm happy to be very wrong about him. I said that he was never going to be a top 20 player. I look like an absolute moron. Uh, a fucking <laughs> moron. If you want to use that language, Dev, which apparently is now acceptable in tennis. We have. Um, we have. Uh, yeah, I, the, the same the same principles applies with Alex Dimonor. A very, very good player. Is he capable of being a top tenner? I don't think so. Is he capable of winning a Grand Slam? I don't think so. It's very easy for me to sit here and say this because I'm not doing the things that he's doing. He's an incredible player. He's just probably not going to ever be a really great player. And what does that say about Casper Root? I mean, yeah. So uh, Three Grand Slam finals. Shout, <laughs> shout out to Alex Dewanauer. He beat Tommy Paul here last year. Doubles up in Mexico in the final. Push, want to hit the WTA? Yeah, just quickly on a, on a rapid fire Finn, on the WTA side of things, um, Wang Zhu and Yu Ye are playing in the final of Austin, uh, all Chinese final. It's more common than you think it is. I was like, is this the first time this has happened? It's not even the first time it's happened this season, Dev. So <laughs> yeah. I was yeah. trying to find like a really interesting line into this, but there really isn't. It's just a regular Austin tournament played with a bunch of really good players. Not a huge fan of this stadium, I have to say. It's the one thing that I took away from the week in Austin. The, the camera angle does kind of appear that I'm looking down to someone's basement somewhere, despite it being outdoors. A bit similar to Dallas in that way as well. Um, mm-hmm. How many Chinese players do you reckon are in the top 100 at the moment, Bush? On the WTA side? Uh, yeah. Six, seven, something like that? 
I think, yeah, I think we're looking at uh, Xiao Zhan Bai it's in 83, which is the last one. But yeah, it feels like you were right about that. This this all Chinese final might be happening more than more often than we think, but I also feel like it's it's because in, in recent times we've seen a couple instances of this, so it does feel like it's happening on a a more rapid occurrence. But I mean, the field bit meh as well. Not to not to <laughs> denigrate uh, ATX Open. Yeah, I mean, there's a decent amount of mid going on in the course of the week. I think in general, San Diego but... <laughs> San Diego is the place to be. It was, and a final between um, Mada Kostyuk and, and Katie Bolt, a hell of a week for both of these players. Um, they had both massive wins during the course of of the week, and I think one of the other things that stuck out to me is that Emma Navarro continues to play really well, um, someone that we sort of highlighted and circled at the start of the week. Um, that being said, Katie Bolt's first final Kostic's first final in a long time, more than a year. Wow. Yeah. Good week for both of them. Uh, is, is that an interesting transition to go from Alex D. Manero into Katie Bolter? Well done. Both, you know, partnerships there. I don't know. Success. In- Ooh, I do <laughs> quickly want to shout out uh, Marina Stalkic, uh, the Canadian 19 year old. Really good win over Melankova and then lost to Donna Vekic, but that was a good match. Um, Three setter. But she. I think LAF had to retire in her first rounder, but I don't know. I, I think Stalkic has has a lot of interesting aspects of her game, and I thought that match against Vekic bodes well for the future. It's true. Last week, um, Paulini won in Dubai. This was following uh, Kalininskaya beating Iga Swiatek <laughs> in the semifinals. After we said that Iga Swiatek looked invincible, she then lost in the semifinal. A lot of travel, I think, and a lot of... A lot of tennis in a very short space of time. It's did not you uh, did you surprising. see her her post match remarks? I think some people took umbrage with her not giving enough credit to uh, her her rival. I did not see this, Dev. It's basically saying it was saying that it was more about how Ego played rather than how well Kalinskaya played, which is probably true. But also, should you be saying that? <laughs> I don't know. Moving on swiftly, publicly traded podcast. Sad bias <laughs> in Santiago in Chile. Uh, quietly, an incredible season for him. He's, I think, won four titles. This could be his fifth title of the season. He will go into the top 20 if he wins in Santiago. We're recording ahead of that final. The diminutive Argentine is uh, really good at tennis, Dev, and is hoovering up all of these clay quarters that are being played in every part of the Global South uh, during this segment of the tennis calendar. How many Argentines are in the top 100 of the ATP, would you guess, Simon? Every week is Sporkle on <laughs> on, <laughs> on Open Era. A lot. It's eight as well. It's eight as okay. well. And I, I feel like Argentina and China on, on both tours kind of are similar in that sense that you're going to see an Argentine in there deep, deep late into a tournament on the ATP. Shout out to Jordan Thompson. Won three matches Tomo. in a single day. Tomo, my boy. Yes, Tomo. Um, won the singles and the doubles in Los Cabos. To win three matches in a day at professional level is uh, an astonishing achievement. Huge shout out to him and his mustache. Great, great, great week for him. Um, and then someone just following up, Jakob Mensik, he obviously lost in, in Qatar. Again, I'll eat humble pie on this one, Dev. I... He had a fantastic week and grew in stature, I think, as the tournament went on. He looks really, really good. Really, genuinely very good. He's probably going to be Prague Jack Draper. I think that could be that could be his <laughs> his, uh, his doppelganger. But yeah, a heavy game. Hits the hell out of the ball. Gotta love that. Shows to Karen Hachinov as well, who I think I said this on the Discord, but probably deserves a lot more credit for the career he's been able to carve out. But people just simply won't give it to him. And I don't really have... The drive to do so either. So I don't know if you do, Simon. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> quickly, here, I wanted I, I wanted to mention this quickly, but Rafa Nadal is coming back for Indian Wells and Miami. Bush, wh- why? <laughs> and also, what do you what are you hoping to see out of this this kind of jaunt as we get really going for the clay stuff? How many weeks do you give it until the very patented 
Hola a todos. A Hola a todos. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible. On an Instagram channel. Oh, well, I mean, God, I. Who knows? It seems a bit. <laughs> it seems like we're hoping for a bit much with this, but I don't know. Like it'd be. It'd be nice to see, but yeah. Hola, hola a todos. It's, Imagine he wins yeah. this tournament. Yeah, <laughs> so you know, funny. It'd be the last time. Um, all right, other stuff. Ben Shelton on night matches. Because of the heat in Acapulco, all of the tennis matches in general are played at night. And Ben Shelton, I think, was shouting this out to basically say that uh, this could be an interesting path forward for tennis to think about that in general, to become more of a night sport at some events during the summer. I think he was shouting out specifically Atlanta where, I don't know, you're literally in a swimming pool level of humidity in mid-August when the tournament is. Uh, I think this is a great idea. I think having the tournaments be more accessible at night and having a transition, I think, would be really cool to see. I don't know how many tournaments actually do this through the course of the year, but I think that's a really cool suggestion. How old is Ben Shelton? 20? 20... 22, I think. 21. Okay, 21, yeah. turning 22 in October. Promote this man. Make him the head of the ATP. This is the best idea I've, I've heard come out of that crew in <laughs> ages. Fantastic. Yep, totally dead on. Dead on right. Andy Murray, Dev, is making noises. More than noises, I would say. More, more than usual. More, more noises than usual. Yeah. yeah. Not to risk the ire of the Murray Musings podcast. Andy Murray is making noises. <laughs> Uh, quote Andy Murray, uh, he is not planning to, pl- quote, play much past the summer. Um, but this BBC article outlines that he is hoping to compete at the Olympic Games before he retires. One year, I'm going to be correct about this, Dev, he's going to retire at Wimbledon. Is it going to be this year? It sure as hell feels like it. So do the Olympics happen after Wimbledon or before? They happen- I think they're after, right? They must be after. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So I, I think. So you think he does Wimbledon, then he does the Olympics, then he's. <laughs> yeah, he does the double. He does the double, throws <laughs> his hip into the crowd. <laughs> it's, a, it's a memento to the adoring fans. Um, here's what I think or how it might go down. The Olympics are after. So if he doesn't get into the Olympics, I guess he won't know till like after, right? Because he needs to get into the top 56. Mm-hmm. To get direct right. entry, he's he's sixty seventh in the world right now. I think he's gonna. He won't say it's his last Wimbledon while he's there, because I think he 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 wants to gear up for the Olympics really and make that the final thing. Because I think in doubles he would like to play as well. So I don't think it'll be like outwardly like this is my last one because I don't think he wants to make it like my career is done done. He wants to take a stab at the Olympics. Mm, okay we'll see i think happens. i'm wrong as well i think i'm wrong I, I it all sounds like he's like i'm sick of this shit like why am i out here why am i doing this things that we've been asking ourselves so <sighs> i didn't realize how far back like, the olympics are quite late in the summer so yeah does he want to do this yeah the olympics brought to you by the pif <laughs> has the ioc thought about that I'm just, you got you better goddamn believe it they have. Uh, Carlos Bernardes. Carlos Bernardes is retiring at the end of the season. A longtime umpire. Um, Rafael Nadal fans will know him really well. I'm sure Mr. Nadal will be sending Carlos Bernardes a big basket of muffins to welcome him into retirement. By all accounts, a pretty good dude. You see fans taking photos with him and have very warm things to say about him. My only memory, you know, Nadal aside of Bernardes was him being someone that did not take a lot of shit on court. And I think I always appreciated <laughs> that about him. So good luck to him in retirement. We're losing all the old guard, Dev. We are we're losing our recipes. We're losing them. We're losing our <laughs> exactly. recipes, man. Um, Shouts to Carlos. I, I will say I can't remember this wasn't this year it was a few years ago but at the the tennis tournament in toronto i was at a court and he was um umpiring at it and it was one of the hottest days one of the hottest days in which there wasn't that much shade at the court we were at and carlos was sitting up in that chair glistening i can only imagine (laughs) what that felt like and he was still calling points and games and everything he was supposed to do and that just 
that screamed professional to me. So we remember the jokes and the good moments, but this man was a, a pro's pro absorbing the hottest of sun to, uh, to help bring this game to us. It screamed professional to you. And to celebrate the occasion, I hope you went and screamed in his face. I did. That right. Was, uh, it's my yeah. aim. That's, that's <laughs> Two challenges remaining, Simon. What do you got this week? I went to the Vancouver International Mountain Film Festival. I have been volunteering there all of this week. I wanted to shout out one particular film I saw called Climbing Never Die. This was a film um, by climbing journalist Matt Groom. He followed the exploits of the Ukrainian climbing team, uh, went to Ukraine itself. This was this was last year and into this year as well to kind of see how the climbing teams are continuing to try and train and compete despite being set against the backdrop of a country literally at war. Um, he visited multiple cities, visited the teams that are still going, and it was a, uh, on, on the one hand, a very kind of touching film about the resilience and the the backbone of that country, and at the same time, very harrowing and the continued reminder that that conflict takes place and the real world consequences of, of the people that find themselves in it. So really good film. It will, I'm sure, come to wider streaming platforms during the course of the year and really recommend it. Definitely. We'll check that out. Um, me this week, I, I think I'm getting a, we're getting a car, Bush. Um, <laughs> I remember the days of you driving me around in your your Hyundai Accent in Vancouver. But uh, we're getting a car and just the process of car shopping. Fascinating. Um, I think we got a good deal, fingers crossed. Still got to pull the trigger on it. But uh, cars, what a world. Do you still have yours? Absolutely not. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> did it give out or did you did you give it away? I actually traded mine in for the BC scrappage scheme. So I oh, wow. got rid of the yeah. car and uh, it gave me a whole year's worth of uh, car sharing credit inside of the province, which was really cool. I'm glad. I'm glad we literally offset my pro car message with that message because that, that <laughs> is the balance. We, we can't speak. leave this podcast with a pro car <laughs> message. Buy a fucking bike, people. Come on. It's a hybrid. It's a hybrid. It's a used car. It's not brand new. Oh, that yeah. makes it That makes it all better. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come at you, bro. <laughs> don't taste me don't taste me okay we'll leave it there <laughs> a reminder we are on twitter.com forward slash open era pod we're also on patreon more importantly join us there get the show at free get it early on sundays plus join the best tennis discord around where we're talking tennis and other stuff all the time patreon.com forward slash open era for producer dylan on the ones and twos and for simon thank you so much for listening to open era we'll talk to you next week 